Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I run through my Curse of Strahd campaign for the Shadow Dark RPG. This is part 14. Uh, I'm just going to be going through a, a few of the sessions we've had so far in Castle Ravenloft. We haven't actually finished it yet, and I think we'll do... I'll probably do one more video on the finale, because I think that'll be next session or the one after, so I'll, I'll probably wait for until we have the finale. And then I'll do a final one that's just sort of a recap of the whole campaign, my thoughts on it, and just, you know, how it went, what I liked, what I really liked, what I thought I could have done better, and overall just everything. So, yeah, probably after this, two more videos in this series. So, the last few sessions, three sessions we've had in Castle Ravenloft have been awesome. Super, super fun. I've enjoyed them just like mad. Ravenloft is going a lot better than I could have hoped, even. Um, in terms of just the pacing, in terms of the stress on the players, in terms of the beats of high and low... I think it's really, really cool. Um, I'm gonna, it, in order to really properly understand how I've been running Ravenloft, I'm gonna have to show you some files that I've uh, been using, and so I think that'll help also. Just give you a sense of how I've been running it. I didn't end up running it like I sort of had planned. Well, I took a lot of ideas from what I had planned in those videos where I talked about how to run Ravenloft as is and then how to adapt it for Shadow Dark. I took ideas from that, but really what I did um, after I put those videos together I found the incredible module, the Count the Castle and the Curse, um, for Shadow Dark, which is sort of a point crawl take on Shadow uh, Ravenloft. Although you start in the dungeons and you go through, um, I'll put a link below to where you can get that or where you can find it. And it's uh, I've done a review on it before. It's a fantastic, fantastic adventure. And I took that map that I really, really liked, and I modified it a bit just on my own. So this is the map from that uh, module. Uh, of Ravenloft. And as you can see, if you know the Ravenloft map, it's really close, just in terms of the major rooms that it deals with. Obviously, it's a point crawl rather than a room-to-room -room crawl, and uh, things are more abstract. I've added a couple rooms and a couple passages, but really that's it. That's all I've done. I've added a few things, and I've uh, just, you know, made changed the names of some of them. As you can tell, that the font is different based on um, what I've done there. So this is, the, this is the actual map I've been using. Although, I have the Curse of Strahd for 5e book, and I have that open off the table, and so if I need more details or if I need relations, you know, I just have the map. And I don't follow the text of it at all, but I just look at the map on the book as I kind of flip from page to page. And that helps me too. So I kind of have this on the screen because I'm running this online, and I have the other one uh, in my book. And so I use those two together to kind of create a, create a good description of the castle as we go through it. And what I did was I broke down every room, and I wrote a description of it in my book. So here, or in my file. So... Uh, this is my little document for um, for the for the uh, for the dungeon, and it's 13 pages. It's 5,000 words. <laughs> it's just uh, room by room, bullet points with italics and um, uh, underlining and bolding for important things as I go through. And so I just have the different things, and they correspond to the different parts of the dungeon. So we have the main floor of the dungeon with the courtyard, the foyer. Uh, the organ room, secret passages, the desecrated chapel. And then I have the court of the count, which is the audience hall, servants quarters, etc. So I have it broken down into different sections. And that helps me for my random encounters tables, which I'll show you in a minute. So essentially, um, I just have the main things that you see in each room with some details about them as you go through and further details if those are necessary. So the courtyard, for example, I have the main doors, huge dark wood, iron banded doors which open on interior hinges to the foyer. And I have bolded and italicized are the locations I'm going to. And then are the different locations. I mean, so that's the, so that's the connections. And and one of the things I did at the start of each one is I had where it exits to, just so at a glance I know exactly where it's going. I didn't hyperlink my own document because it's only 13 pages and I made it so I know where everything is. But the idea is I know exactly where the courtyard can go to, right? It can go to the foyer, the servants' quarters, the parapets. Um, the foyer can go to the courtyard, organ room, desecrated chapel, audience hall, and barracks. So, you know, again, just you know where you're going from each room. So if they're there, I know what to look to and I know where to go. Um... And then I have the creatures that can be found in underlined and bolded. And then I have, um, yeah, so that's the, so those are the three things I do. I have, um, let's see, what is it? But yeah, bolded and italicized are places to go. Um, underlined and italicized are magic items or items of import. And um, bolded and underlined are creatures. Just so I have three really quickly, um, you know, things at a glance that I can see what I'm doing. So this is the carriage house, the overroom garden, the servant's door, and the overlook. Now, I had to change the overlook here. Actually, this is not accurate for what I actually ran. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, that's the overlook. Then I have the towers, and uh, that's, that's accurate to what I ran. 
And then, um, yeah, so basically I have run this, I put this document together, I managed to complete it all before our first session of the dungeon. Of the dungeon. And I haven't changed the document since. I've been running it as written. I've changed a couple things as we're going through, but only changed them because the players gave me better ideas than I had. That was it. Uh, otherwise, I'm trying to run it as written. I'm trying not to change it. I want this to be the difficulty that it is. And you know, I had sort of an idea of how hard it was going to be beforehand. I don't. I didn't want to modify it based on in Shadow Dark whether the players lost their spells or not, whether they kept their spells or not. I didn't want to, you know, shift that around on the fly. I probably will have to at this point, but. I'll talk about that more in a minute. So this is just the basic dungeon. I have the courtyard, the foyer, um, the organ room, and I basically tried to run that as is. You have the opulent marbled table, the ornate dining halls, the illusion of the count playing at the organ. I added the secret passages here. Now, there are secret passages in Curse of Strahd for 5e. There are no secret passages in the count, the castle, and the curse. But I wanted there to be because I thought it was a value. It was a, a, a If they searched around and if they found one, then they would have a way of, you know, navigating the castle without having to be on the main floor. And so I wanted to give them that option. And so the, the, they, there were secret passages and they ended up finding them. Um, so maybe the best way to do this is to just run through how they ran through it. I think that would be best. Um, because it's gone really, really well so far. The players started off by going, obviously, to the courtyard. They rode their horses in. Uh, I, I think in the last um, one of these uh, recaps, I talked about how... They had passed a carriage on the road, they had let it go, and they had arrived at the castle in the courtyard, and that was where we had ended, basically. They had just arrived at Castle Ravenloft. Well, um, or maybe I had just... Yeah, I don't even think I had discussed how they had entered the castle, but yeah. So they, they entered the castle. They got to the courtyard, they left their horses there, the portcullis closed afterwards. And I described how they could see into the back half of the courtyard, but that it was divided in about evenly, bisected by two walls that connected the exterior walls of the castle to the keep, north and south of the keep, and then the portcullises that you could see through into the back half of the courtyard. The north one was open, the south one was closed, and through the south one they could see an overgrown garden. Through the north one they could see some buildings, uh, you know, the outbuildings of the, of the keep in the castle. But they weren't interested in those, they decided to go straight for the castle. So they went in through the main doors, they entered the foyer. And in the foyer, they saw the great dusty hall lit by torches, the vaulted ceiling held by stone columns. What they didn't do is find any perched gargoyles. Um, now, there are perched gargoyles up there. And what I said is if uninvited guests, one swoops down to attack one per visit to room as torches snuff out. So that's really only going to happen if and when they destroy the, the blood glass heart and they come back through here and it's night. If those three things have all, all, all happened, then the gargoyles will attack one per visit to the room. A gargoyle swoops down and attacks just for a scare, for some stress, and for some minor damage. Um, but even minor damage at this point, as you'll see, is important, very important to them. There was a suit of plate armor. It's a rec replica of Strahd's armor, and I decided actually it was Strahd's armor um, with a plus one greatsword. Uh, and if touched, the armor makes up one plus three attack for falling to pieces, can be recovered as plate and a plus one sword. That didn't end up happening, and so I decided to meld this with Strahd's armor. The, uh, the sort of, uh, you know, encounter that you can have up on the up on the thing. I, I decided to meld those together, and so this is actually Strahd's armor. Uh, it turned out to be very important, but not initially. They just walked right past it. They didn't interact with it. From the south, they could hear organ music playing down a short hall that opened to grand double doors to the organ room. And then there was a long stained glass hall to the east lined with suits of armor, and they could hear whispers of prayers from the desecrated chapel. Uh, they, of course, I didn't say, they just, I didn't say, you know, here whispers of prayers from the desecrated chapel. I described this much more, you know, viscerally and without letting them know where, you know, what room was what room. <laughs> just said from down the long hall, are lined with suits of armor, there are these stained glass windows above. It creates a very, you know, interesting effect down the hall. And you can hear these fractures, fra you can hear prayers, essentially. And the priest, the character who's, who's playing a priest, could speak the language of the prayers in the old, basically Latin, you know, celestial. And what I said was that they are the equivalent of getting through three quarters of the prayer and then being stopped and then starting again. So the prayers are never finished. It's not that they're like just you hear a fragment of it, but you can hear the beginning of the prayer it goes through and then it cuts off and then it starts again. And all these different voices overlapping with different prayers, trying to finish that none of them are finished. So that was sort of how he got the sense that the chapel was something evil or had been desecrated or something like that. Uh, and then there was a small stair in the southeast corner. So they decided they wanted to go straight for the organ music. They were like, well, we got to go to the organ music, right? I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> we, we can't not. Uh, and so they went into the room with the organ, or they went to the organ room. 
And they saw opulent marbled walls, glass chandeliers reverberating to the organ's tones, right? An ornate dining table filled with lavish bread of fine dining. And a man at the organ on the far side of the wall with these pipes, you know, going up to the ceilings, playing very loudly. But playing with uninterest in them. Now, it's an illusion, and the players didn't... Uh, it, was, it was great. It was the sort of thing where they were like, well, what do we... I mean, he's right there. He's right there. What do we do? <laughs> uh, and they are like, hello? You know, we've come to... And he didn't respond. And uh, one of the players kind of went over to the side of him and looked at him and was like, hello? And he looked up at them and there was, like I said, there was unlooking, unfeeling, unthinking eyes just kind of as he continued to play. And so the players were like, well, we got to take our chance. If it's him, we got to take our chance. So they shot at him. <laughs> and so what happened was he immediately played the loud thing, vanished with an echoing laugh, and these shadows came out of the pipes and attacked. And it was a great scene. It was like, Phew. And the players were like, we should have known. Obviously, that's not him. But what, so I'm using the underclock die, which is, uh, I mean, you guys should look this up, but it's a great mechanic for these sorts of dungeon crawls. It's very stressful. It, it adds to the sense of um, building urgency because the players get a sense of when the next encounter is going to come and they get a sense of how much time they have before without being precisely aware of how much time because it's a random roll. But it's not just a random encounter roll where you're not just rolling 1d6 and seeing if it happens. Uh, the underclock makes it much more like a progress. So uh, subtracted a d8 from the underclock. And I think they roll like a 7 or something like that. So immediately they start off with a, a massive chunk to the random encounter table. Or uh, to, you know, <laughs> to the random encounter possibility. It's much more likely to happen very quickly. And the shadows, I rolled d4, and I think I got four. And they were really, really hard. I mean, the, the they, shadows in Shadow Dark Horse drained strength. And they didn't do much damage, but the draining of the strength was so scary to the players. They realized, uh-oh, we're, we're, we're really going to be... Like, this is the first encounter, and we are going to be... Uh, we're going to be drained. Not just in terms of our strength or our hit points, but we are going to start losing stuff. They started to realize that this was going to be an attrition. That getting through the castle was going to be a matter of attrition. And, and, and their whole goal here was to find the blood glass heart, destroy it, and then go and find Strahd and stake him. All within the 12 hours they had, because they arrived here about 6. Or no, I think they arrived here at 8. And sunset in this game is about 6.30. Because it's that time of year. So they have about 10 hours, 10 and a half hours, to get through the whole castle. And I'm basically doing it so that they can search a room in about 10 minutes. An encounter takes about 10 minutes, which is a round, right, in, 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 other turn, in, in older games' turns. And then if they spend time talking and discussing what they're going to do, if it's a really long time, I, I check, chunk it up by five minutes. So that there's sort of these other increments, too, that can happen. And if they take an extra long time in a room, I might add an extra five minutes or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically doing, you know, time is chunking along at an even rate. And they're going through and trying to find their way through. So it's, it's pretty consistent, and they know, they, they, they know that. Well, the fight was great. Um, it was just demoralizing, but not like, like they weren't destroyed or anything. They just lost some strength, and they're like, oh, no. And that's not something they can usually recover from. Um, and they realized that, of course, this had just been a complete complete waste of time. Now, they didn't search the food. They didn't taste the food. Um, they didn't do any of that. They just left. And they're like, all right, well, we got to try to find the Blood Glass Heart. They knew from the Book of Straw that it was in the spires of Ravenloft. So they were like, well, we got to go up. So let's go back to the main hall and go through that big door. And they did, and they rolled like, an because on, on the underclock die, you roll d6s at first, and if they explode, or if, if you roll a six, it explodes. And so they rolled like three, two sixes in a row, and then a five. So they immediately had another random encounter. So they had the fight with the, the shadows, and then they immediately had another fight. And I rolled randomly on the random encounter table, and it was d6 shadows. And I rolled six shadows. <laughs> but... Um, in, in, in the underclock, if you get exactly to zero, which I think they were at exactly zero, the clock resets to three, and you just have a sign of the random encounter. And so what I described was that they realized their shadows, their own shadows, were frozen in place, but they were like following them, but they were as if they weren't moving. Their own shadows had kind of frozen into this position. They were like, oh no, more of these things? And I said, out of the seven of you, because there's four of them and three companions, Esmeralda, uh, Abner, and Van Richten. Six of them have these shadows. One of them didn't. And so they were they're like, all right, well, we're going to stand close together and we're going to pour, pour holy water on them because they realized the holy water was effective against them in that first fight. So they all stood really close together. They all uncorked their holy water bottles and they poured a bunch down and it just destroyed them. Uh, so that was great. They were clever. It was funny. It was a funny image kind of broke the tension. But also it was a use of their resources. Holy water, they only had a handful. I mean, they had like, I think between all of them, I think they had like nine 
or 10 holy water flasks, and they used four on this one, so washed them out. So they're only, I think they're down to two holy water flasks left, maybe three. Uh, by the time like we actually get to the end. They only have like three left. Every resource is valuable, and they're realizing that. Every single thing that they have is valuable, and it's slowly being drained away over the course of this dungeon crawl, which I loved. It was super fun. Uh, they got up to the, the, the room with the throne, and I described how there was this desiccated corpse with a beautiful crown on the throne. Now, <laughs> I'm debating something. As written, I didn't do this, but I think it would make sense that to get into Strahd's tomb, you have to have the crown of the king. And so I think that they're going to have to come back and grab this. I think they're going to have to. Because it's only in-game, it's only 2.30. They have plenty of time. I think they're going to go down. Well, I'll talk about that more. But I think they're going to have to come back and grab the crown. That's going to be awesome. Uh, but anyway, there's the crown of the king on the throne. Uh, a beautiful crown. They didn't take it. They were like, nope, nope, not touching that. We're going to leave that be. But one of the players... Uh, the, the the wizard, the mage, um, he has a very high intelligence and the room is covered in these murals or these rather these uh, these tapestries. And he was suspicious. He was like, I wonder if there's a secret door here because there was one passage out of the room and he was like, you know, this is the sort of room where I put a secret door. The, the throne room, right? A way of quickly getting in and out. Behind tapestries for sure. So he's like, do the tapestries look like anything? And sure enough, um, I had made them to be uh, a, a sign. So if you go to the audience hall here, I had faded and moth-eaten tapestries, depicting Strahd's victories over the crusade of the Three Paradises. Uh, be hidden behind the image of Strahd's victory on the ice is a secret door leading to the secret passages. Well, in the book of Strahd and in his histories, Strahd lost the battle on the ice and was captured. That's where he was captured, imprisoned, and tortured, and that's where he broke and decided to be, you know, he, he sold his soul and basically become evil. <laughs> or it's one of the ways that he started that. So, so um, that's what, you know, really did him in. He was already not a good guy, but that was what really did him in. And so the, 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 the fact that it showed a victory on the ice by a player who had read the book of Strahd and who had the notes from it was like, wait, Strahd won that? I thought he lost it. And he looked in the book and he was like, oh, yeah, he did lose it. Huh. I want to go investigate that. And so he went over to it and he found the secret door behind it. So I was, I was clever. I was, I was happy that he was clever. And I thought that what I had done there was a good way of showing, right, that there's some secret door here um, because something wasn't right about that. So they found the secret passages and they used them. They went all the way down or not all the way down, they went down to the ground floor and they explored and they saw that there was a bunch of eye holes through all the walls and they were able to look into lots of different rooms. They looked into the servants' quarters, they looked into the desecrated chapel on a couple levels, they looked into the foyer, they looked into the organ room. They realized that this thing was pretty extensive. And they went up to this top and it stopped in this like closet. It looked like a closet. There were mirrors, there were, there were clothes, the, all this stuff. And they were like, all right, well, I guess we should, uh, yeah, I guess we should um, go out here because it's the highest we can get, and it looks interesting. So after having decided where they were going to go, they would have decided to go out into the, the, the closet, essentially. And in the closet, it was the closet inside of a, like the walk-in closet off a bathroom, the, the, the bathroom. And then beyond that was the Count's bedchamber. So I just combined all of that into the Count's bedchamber on the map. It's all one room, but it's the same, it's the same concept as in uh, Ravenloft and in Curse of Strahd, uh, as usual. Well, they came out of the uh, into this closet, and they decided to search it, and they found this little sapphire, um, this blue, beautiful gem that had been carved to look like, or had been cut down to look like an eye. It was sort of a vaguely an eye shape. Now, this is one of the things that I sort of changed, because as written, um, in order to get to the blood glass heart, which is in the hidden belfry, they have to pass through the fire, which is the illusory fire beneath the statue of Irina. And to get into the Belfry itself, they have to have three glass keys, red, a blue, and a yellow. And I developed this riddle. Um, so basically, <laughs> as, as you'll see, um, they had to find uh, three hidden keys in the castle. It's very, very, you know, video gamey. It's very, very uh, ridiculous, but I didn't mind because I thought Strahd is, um, he's, he was, he's going to make you see his life. He's going to make you live through his castle. He's going to make you go through. He's an egomaniac. It, not only is it going to be draining your health and attacking you in all these ways, and so it's going to be making it much easier to fight him. It's much easier for him to fight you um, as you go through this castle to get to him. He wants to. He wants you to see the whole thing. He wants you to see the tragedy of his life. He's not worried about you. So, you know, I justified it in that way. It's pretty meta, but it's fine. I don't care. <laughs> it's fun for a game, and it was great in the effect. They really got into it, and they had a lot of fun with it, and I did too. So it worked great. 
Anyway, these three keys are hidden around the castle, and mostly they're hidden um, in ways that relate to Strahd, Sergei, and, and uh, Tatiana. So, the, uh, the ice-shaped sapphire, which was resting in the pocket of one of the dressing gowns, um, I initially had it be basically, the, you, you put it into a statue of Sergei, you put it into one of the, the, the uh, in, in the Hall of Heroes, there's a statue of Sergei, you put it into one of his eye sockets, which is empty, and a little hidden drawer appears, and the blue key is there. And then I had originally had Strahd's um, red key be in the Bath of Blood, well, that's just where it was, uh, in the bath chamber, it was at the bottom of that, and then I had the yellow key be in, behind a picture of Tatiana in the study. I had it be behind her picture, right, right, right in the picture. She had a, you know, a, a golden key on a chain around her neck, and uh, if you kind of cut open the picture or take it down, there's a little alcove there, and you take out the key. So that was initially how I had it planned. Um, so there was the bathtub, the statue, and the picture. Well, they found the, the the crystal. They found the sapphire gem right away. But then as I was thinking, I was like, why would Strahd just have it to be in a random pocket of his dressing gown? One of the keys, like it's so. The fact that they found it was a total chance because they were like, well, we might as well search this while we're here. But they didn't have to. And it's just a dressing gown. Why would it, like, one of the most important parts of the puzzle be just a random dressing gown? So I realized that didn't make a lot of sense. So I decided to change it. But I wanted to keep the same idea. But you'll see how I changed it as I go forward here. But, but that was the idea. So they still have this. And I think I'm going to change it so that it does still get them something if they find the Hall of Heroes, which they haven't found yet. And they put it in there, they'll get, like, a cross or like a you know, like an ankh or like a cross, a holy symbol that is obviously like a key to something and it's to the altar and it opens up a path down into the brother's tomb, which is otherwise sealed off. And the brother's tomb has a lot of stuff that they can use, Re restorative stuff and uh, healing stuff and maybe a magic item. I don't know if they're going to do that because they're pretty dead set on going now. But, you know, if they happen to go that way, they'd have a way of restoring themselves. Okay, so... They had, uh, they, they went into the bathroom, they found the bathtub full of blood, and they were like, nope, not touching it. Because I described how one of, like, they saw, like, a bubble, like, boop, come up through the bathroom. They're like, nope, 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 not interested. They searched through the bedchamber, they searched through the, the, uh, the, uh, study. Uh, not the, not the study, the reception hall. And they found this big map on the ground, which showed where basically everyone was. <laughs> like, everyone. The reception hall has a huge map that shows figures Estrad wishes to follow, little, like, banners with them like the you know the uh, the marauders map from harry potter basically <laughs> but they saw baba erwin mardikov van richten the party all of them are on there irena is Strasny, ulysses esmeralda basically everybody who they've interacted with so far as well as a couple people they haven't uh, like vladimir horngard bishop lucian well they've, they've interacted with bishop lucian escher velasco who um i mentioned but he's not on here or he's not here uh, well he wasn't at the castle he was in uh, he was in uh, the town he had moved to the town so, uh, because again, the, uh, the, the festival of the Undying Sun, Escher is there, right? He's not, <laughs> he is not here at the castle. He is there at the uh, festival of the Undying Sun, or he was. And then um, they, the, the door to the study was padlocked and locked. There's a stairway leading up from the reception hall um, into the tower lounge and then up to Sergei's chamber. So I think that's where we ended one session was they were right there and they decided, we're trying to decide what to do. The next session was they just started off and they decided to go up to the tower um, and try to find this this uh, this tower peak. So they went up the tower lounge. Uh, they passed right by it. They fought some. Uh, they went all the way up to Sergei's chamber. That's right, and they found it. Sergei's chamber in this is uh, uh, I made it kind of um, where is it here? Yeah, Sergei's chamber. Uh, the room has been smashed to pieces, smashed bookcases, a shattered desk, a broken bed with slashed and torn sheets. Uh, a portrait's been slashed, leaving an image of a man with fair hair and blue eyes. Around his neck is a small silver key on a chain. Behind that painting is a compartment with the altar key in the desecrated chapel. So that's what I'm swapping. I swapped uh, the, uh, the key behind the portrait to Sergei's here, and I made it the blue one. And then I took the, the key to the chapel, and I'm going to put it as like an onk in the Hall of Heroes. And the reason I changed it was because the players were getting a little demoralized. And I'll explain why. They had gone all the way up to Sergei's chamber. They hadn't. They didn't find that. They didn't search behind the painting. They just made a general search of the room. And I said, you don't find anything. Then they went down and, and they made their way across the tower. Uh, the bridge was very narrow. They had to be careful. There was high winds. And then two of them almost died. Uh, Abner fell off and they had to pull him back up. And then Ansgar, uh, the uh, priest played by the player who used to play Ulysses, he almost fell off to his death. And the wind it was very deadly. Then they went into the tower, and they made it all the way up to the tower peak. And there, they found a little chest. 
And as they were looking at the chest, uh, the mage decided to cast protection from evil on himself and open it. And I said, well, you cast a protection from evil on yourself. Um, you feel the urge to leap off the tower, but because you've cast that spell, which prevents charm effects, you are not. And he was like, oh man, I'm so glad I did that. Um, but inside the chest was just a piece of, par piece of parchment. And written on the parchment were the following words. The three guard the one, the guardians overshadow their charge. In traitor's eye, in unclean waters, and around the beloved's neck. And that was it. And they were like, oh no. So the three guard the one means the three keys guard the one uh, person that they're hiding. And the guardians overshadow their charge. So the two towers stand above, or the three towers, I should say, stand over the thing that they're guarding. And, and in the way that I've positioned it, <laughs> the study, which is the access to the hidden belfry, is right in the middle of the three towers. It's right in where their shadows all pass over it, right? It's right, like, equidistant from them in the middle of the castle. Doesn't look like it on here, but that's how I did it. So, initially, in Traitor's Eye, it was in the statue, in Unclean Waters, in the bathtub, and around the Beloved's neck, which was the picture of, of Tatiana in the study. Well, they were like, in Traitor's Eye. I wonder if that means this is the picture of Sergei back in his chamber because they knew he's the traitor, he betrayed his brother, he has blue eyes, we know that from the, the portrait we found, we know that, I wonder if this gem or whatever, let's go and try to see if we can do it. So they, they went back to his chamber, fought some whites on the way and got some uh, more con drained. Really, really unhappy about that. And they went into Sergei's chamber and I decided, okay, I'm gonna change it so that the portrait has his key and the, the gem and the eye has to do with a different, you know, uh, has to do with the, the, the chapel puzzle. So they took down the portrait and they found a little alcove and inside was a blue glass key. I'm like, yes, we got one. Okay, so in unclean waters. Well, who knows where that is, but it could be the bathtub. It could be the bath chamber. So they went down to the bathtub, they disturbed the water, and the water broke out as the wailing, which is a, a blood wraith, essentially. And I, I ran it. It's, it's tough. The blood wraith, uh, it's not on here, it's in my other uh, document, but it's basically a wraith uh, with, I think it only gets one attack instead of two or three, but then it gets its whale every turn, and it's a hard wisdom check, or you're stunned, and you can't act that round. And that's rough. It's a DC 15 wisdom check is really hard. It meant that only a handful of people were acting every turn. And, uh, and it drained wisdom. That's what I said it did for an attack. It drained wisdom, and that was really scary for the priest. It was scary for everybody, but it was especially scary for the priest who uses wisdom to cast all the spells and to do everything. So <laughs> they fought it, they killed it, but man, it was uh, an intense fight. And they were like, no, 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 no. But finally they managed to defeat it. And it's, it died and the blood splashed everywhere. And then the blood congealed into a little red key, a little red glass key. And they were like, yes, we have that. So they had the two. So then they were like, well, we've got to look for the third one. And I was like, well, uh, yeah, well, that was the end of a session. I think it was right there. The next session was... All right, we've got to go find the third one. So they went up to this. They went out to the the, 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 the doors that had been padlocked. And like, we should check this out, right? So they went into the study. They saw the big portrait of Tatiana, and they were like, it, it would be too easy if it was just behind this one, right? And I agreed. And one of the things that the players had said in the previous session was around the beloved's neck, she was burned, right? She was burned alive. So we're not looking for remains, but I wonder if there's like a statue of her where she was burned or something like that. And I was like, that's a great idea. And so in the overlook, down below in the courtyard, I decided that there was this shrine to her, and it was a marble statue of her being burned, essentially. <laughs> and within that was the was the the last key. And I thought that was way better than putting it behind the picture. But I also wanted them to be rewarded for looking behind the picture. So what they did was they took it down, and they saw a mural of a woman being burned with an overlook of them. You could see the uh, mountains in the distance. It looked like she was in the ground level of the castle outside. And around her neck, there was a little like glint of gold in the mosaic. And they're like, okay, so that's what we're looking for. And then they were attacked by some whites who had been following them. Um, because one of the players messed with the musical instruments in the room and it crashed and then uh, there was a, a loud noise and the underclock died, she had to roll a d8 and she rolled an 8. So we went way down, the, uh, the whites attacked and in that fight, uh, tit uh, um, yeah, Titus, who was going to cast uh, Fireball, he decided to cast it. He was like, should I cast it? Should I not? Should I cast it? Should I not? He has advantage on casting it. He decided to cast it and try to burn the, the, them in the other room. And I was like, well, you can do so, but you'll probably burn the map and you know, it'll go off in there. He's like, that's fine. I'll do that. So I'll cast it into the other room and hopefully it'll catch them in a blast. And he rolled like a four and a six. And so he lost Fireball. 
And that was a huge demoralizing blow to him and to the whole party. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. They're like, oh, we just lost Fireball. That was their massive damage dealer, their get out of jail free card. They'd used it a couple times already to great effect to protect themselves. Man, the loss of that was huge and it was so demoralizing. It was great for me, but it was horrible for them. They were like, no, what are we gonna do? And he was just like, "That's I, I think we're dead, that's it. It got worse because earlier on in one of the fights, the cleric had lost his level three spell, which was late arrest. So now he, he couldn't do that either, the priest. So they had lost their level three spells. Really demoralizing. But they had two keys. So they decided to go down. They went down, they went down, they went down to the courtyard, and they finally found their way uh, over to the, uh, the uh, statue of Tatiana being burned. And I described everyone had to roll wisdom checks, and those who failed saw a vision. And they had to take some sanity damage, but they saw a vision of her burning and screaming and cursing and Strahd standing there watching, uh, you know, with an evil, you know, wild look on his face. And, and then it, you know, flashed back to the present. And in that, I allowed them to roll a perception check or wisdom check, and one of them succeeded. And he said, yeah, you, you saw a little key around her neck, but in the, in the, uh, you saw like a golden locket around her neck, but in the, on the statue, it's a little key. And so even if they hadn't gone and made the connection that it was around her neck, they would have seen that, and that would have been the clue. So uh, Titus approached, and I described how the statue you know, rolled its head, grinding sound as the marble turned and looked right at him. And um, he said something to it in Barovian, or in Vistani, because he, knew, he knows that she's a Vistana. And she screamed at him through flames, through flames, in Vistani. So he cast uh, Burning Hands on the marble, and I described how the screaming started again and how the around her neck, where the thing was, it like melted away like flesh melting. And it was like, ugh, gross. The marble melted, and underneath it was the golden key. And so he grabbed it, and it burned a little imprint of the golden key in his hand, but now he has the gold glass or the yellow glass key. They have all three keys. It was a really cool moment. I thought it was awesome, very flavorful. Um, that scream also made the underclock die go down. So they decided to go back into the castle through the, they were in the courtyard anyway. They didn't want to go back through the towers, climb back up the rope that they had dropped and go through the top. They wanted to go through um, the main audience, or the main courtyard. So they went back to the courtyard, came into the courtyard. And when they came into the foyer, they had rolled uh, down to three on the random encounter table. Um, the armor was gone. Strahd's armor. And they were like, oh no. Uh, they heard it coming from upstairs in the throne room. So they tried to find their way through the organ and room, and they saw that there was a way to open the secret door from this side, but it involved playing the organ, and they didn't want to risk another loud noise to draw more attention. So they decided to go up to the, the throne room where they knew there was a secret door they could access. And they got in there, and there's the armor standing at, at attention beside the, the uh, throne. And so one of the characters walks closer to it, and he's like, I want to try to see if it can... And it reacts, of course, it immediately starts walking towards him, and combat is rolled, it wins initiative, and in one strike, it knocks him out. Drops him to zero. That's the first time I think anyone's gone unconscious in this uh, session, or in this in this dungeon. And it starts to happen a lot more frequently as they as they start to run out of resources. Anyway, so they started to fight it, and during the fight, one of the players, again, the wizard, he lost magic missile. <laughs> I think it was this fight, it might have been the next, but he lost magic missile, which means he's now down to two spells. He has two damage dealing spells. He has burning hands and he has acid arrow. And that's it. So he is he is like really demoralized now. And the fight was rough because they they the armor was completely immune to magic. So even though he cast it, it didn't do anything. I think he you think he cast no, he must have lost magic missile on another fight, because this one he cast magic missile and it did nothing. Um, and smite did nothing. So it was just taking physical damage. But they destroyed it, and then as it broke, all the pieces shattered and went on to all of them, and I described how they took D4 damage each as it started to, like, you know, try to crush them. Each of the pieces of armor, like, wrapped around them and tried to crush them, and they had to pull them off. It was really dramatic and pretty scary, as some of the characters couldn't get them off really quickly. Other ones got it off first turn, but they all took some damage from it, um, except Arthur, who had been away shooting at it with his pistol. He wasn't close to it when it broke. But anyway, they tore off all the pieces, and the pieces, like, crushed themselves, you know, imploded on themselves, and, um, and you know, were these wrecked pieces of metal except the greatsword. And so Abner took it, and now he has a plus one greatsword, which saved their lives in a minute, in a minute, because they were like, oh no. So one of the things, the reason they were coming back into the castle is because as the as they took the key from the statue around Esmeralda's neck, or Esmeralda, sorry, uh, Tatiana, the statue of her, she whispered in Vistani, um, through flames, through flames. And they were like, okay, so it was through flames to bring you, but also you said it again afterwards. And they said, well, there, were, there, was fi there was that fire back in the study. 
And I had them all roll intelligence checks. And I was like, yeah, you guys remember that there wasn't like additional firewood. There wasn't like a stack of it, but it was burning brightly and merrily. And they're like, okay, so it's some sort of magic. Okay, so we got to go up there. So they went back to the study. Uh, and that's why they had this fight on the way. And they got into the study um, and they poked at the back of the fireplace with the long sword. And they realized that, that the back of the wall was an illusion. And they just walked through the fire. I had them take a little damage. They took some stress, but they got through the illusory room uh, behind the study, the little hidden belfry, and in the false treasury. And in there was a small chest. There were some iron sconces on the walls uh, with a torch. And uh, and in the uh, on against the far wall, there was a skeleton holding its neck, and in the other hand it had a false had a, had a, had a, had a, um, a torch. And they were like, well, we could, open the, we could open the chest or we could try to mess with these sconces. And they decided to mess with the sconces. And they put the torch back in the one that was missing it and the other secret door opened. They decided not to mess with the chest, which is good because it was a sleeping gas. A hard con check or fall asleep for D6 hours. And if a six is rolled, the party gets the benefits of a long rest, but the underclock die becomes a D10. So really rough if they, if they get that D6 rest in. <laughs> but that would have been hard regardless. They left it alone. They didn't mess with it. They went beyond it into beyond the false treasury, which was this narrow hall leading to a, a door, uh, leading to a domed tower with a rope that hangs through a hole in the ceiling and a spiral stair that leads up to the hidden belfry, which is where... Um, the, uh, which is where the uh, blood glass heart is hidden. So they were there. But in the darkness wait 10 glass, uh, stained glass gargoyles. And I just said, said they descended uh, waves, two waves of five upon whoever enters the secret wall. I just had them all attack. This was probably unfair of me, but I just had them all attack. I was like, there's seven of them, right? They'll be able to handle it. Man, it was so, so close. So close. The action economy was way against them. They and I, I'm glad that I did it in the end because it was like they were almost at the blood glass heart. Something hard had to fight them. Something really hard had to fight them, and they felt it, man. Over the course of the fight, because these things were immune to non-magical damage, basically Arthur and um, and and uh, Esmeralda could do nothing. They had basically no abilities that they could use to help. They were there to take damage, to distract, to um, to bring people back up when they had gone down with potions, if possible. Um, now they didn't, they didn't think to use uh, holy water, which I would have let them use. That would have worked, but, uh, they just didn't do that. During the fight, uh, Van Richten very nearly died. Uh, Abner very nearly died. Esmeralda was fine. Actually, she was pretty much fine. <laughs> Everybody else, except I think Ansgar and Esmeralda and Titus, maybe Titus might not have gone unconscious. Everybody else went down, very nearly died. I mean, it was, it was really close over the course of the fight. And it was the sort of thing where, like, two people would drop in a round, and it would take a potion and the, the priest casting cure uh, heal to bring them back up. And then the next round, like, three people would be unconscious. I mean, it was like, do, 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 do. And every round, they were killing one or two of these things. So it was like, the first round, there were ten. Then there were eight. Then there were, like, five. Then there were, like, three. Then there were two. Then there was one. And so finally, they, did, 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 they finally worked it down. But, man, by the end of that fight, they were exhausted and drained. And at this point, they I think the the... Best person, two of them have 14 hit points out of like 30 or 32, 29. Everyone else has like seven or eight hit points. All of their cons have been drained. By this point, some of them have lost wisdom, strength. Their max con has been drained. Um, uh, like they are, they've lost spells. Van Richten lost his fire spell. Of course, they lost both of the fireball and magic missile. They've lost the priest spell. He does still have heal and he does still, they all have protection from evil and, uh, and, the, and they, so they have, they still have spells. I think, um, I think the the Cursed Knight, Varia, I think she's lost... Oh, the Knight of St. Idris. Um, she's lost both uh, uh, Willow Man. She might have Willow Man, but I think she's lost Oak Ashthorn and Eyebite. So she's down to maybe one spell. Maybe she doesn't have any. I don't remember. Um, but they're all, like, at their limit. And they haven't even destroyed the, the Blood Glass Heart yet. And they can't rest. They, well, they could. I suppose they could. They could find a place to hide, but... Uh, it's about 2.30, which means that they take a long rest, which I'm saying minimum would be six hours. They're they're looking at, first of all, underclock going to D, D8 because it'd be a normal rest, um, night falling and straw waking, and they can't risk that. So they can't take a rest. They have to rely on the priest casting heal, and they haven't done that yet. That's where we ended last session. So tense. They're right there, though. I mean, they don't know that they're right by the blood glass heart. They, they, they think, oh, we might have to fight something else before we get there. They don't know. They don't have to. And they're worried about how to destroy it. It actually won't be that hard to destroy. But they do uh, they do have to find a way to get to it. It won't be that hard to get to it. They'll, they'll, they'll find their way to it. Um, but 
the uh, <laughs> the, the real test, the real trick will be um, whether they can, uh, yeah, whether they can uh, get to Strahd. I think this has been really fun. It's been really, really cool. They haven't explored anything down in the barracks, mess halls, larders, torture ter chamber, flooded dungeon. I have a bunch of stuff down there if they wanted to go that way. Brother, or, uh, Dr. Maxim is in the flooded dungeon <laughs> if they want to go down that way. Um, they haven't done anything with the desecrated chapel or the, therefore, the Sergei's cross and the brother's tomb. They haven't done that. But they've pretty much gone everywhere else. Oh, they also didn't go to the servants' quarters of the Hall of Heroes. But they've gone pretty much everywhere else. And they've done quite a lot. And I think that's really cool that they have uh, found just a lot of the stuff here and uh, and have interacted with it. And, and it's it's been super fun for me. And I think they've been having fun. Although, again, there's these highs and lows. Every time they get a key, every time they beat a fight, they're like, oh. But then they have these horrible moments where they lose almost all their spells or they get attacked by these 10 gargoyles and they're like drained. And I didn't use the standard uh, stat block for gargoyles. I, I, at first, I initially said I was going to, like in my mind, but then I realized, nope, nope, that's too hard. 25 hit points or 20 hit points, too much. So I dropped it down to 11. So they only had 11 hit points each and that was doable. That was doable. But man, uh, this is tough, <laughs> but it's super fun. And I think again, the last session, they're gonna find the next session, I would imagine, They'll find the Blood Glass Heart, destroy it, go down to the catacombs, realize they have to kind of race to try to get into Strahd's tomb, break into it, and then there will be a kind of desperate fight against his minions while he sleeps as they open his coffin and stake him. And that will be the end of the campaign because then, of course, the whole castle is going to start crumbling and, and collapsing, classic style, and they're going to have to get out. And to get out, I mean, that means they have to go <laughs> up through the catacombs uh, up through the up to the spire, over to the I guess you could do the tower lounge or the hall of heroes. Get onto the parapet and climb out to the towers. Or uh, if they have the secret door to the flooded dungeon, they could go that way. Or if they have the secret door from the brothers' tomb, they could go up to the desecrated chapel out through the foyer in the courtyard. That would be the fastest way. But if they don't have that, they're going to be in very you know, it'll be a tough ask to get out of the castle before it collapses. So anyway, that is what we've been doing for the last few sessions. Hope this has been interesting, guys. Um, I am having a blast with this whole campaign, and I hope uh, you guys follow through for the very last session, which will be probably next Monday. All right. I'll talk to you all later. See ya.